Ben Osborne, editor-in-chief of Bleacher Report, a uh, longtime sports journalist, editor, hockey fan, friend of Don, and uh, really happy to be here with Dr. Heather Berlin and NHL goalkeeper Robin Lehner. Um, Robin, one of the kind of cooler things in sports, uh, you know, you guys, typically athletes have league-issued uniforms, not a lot of room to improvise. Um, NHL goalies have a unique gift where they get to design their helmet. My daughter and I are always watching the games. What animal is that or what cityscape? You know, you see artistic flair. You know, you see articles about the guys that make them. Cool. I like it. It's creative. Um, you don't often see messages. Um, for those of you that did know that goalies got to design them, he can explain his. If you didn't know it, again, very cool thing about hockey but usually it's pretty basic stuff. Robin, what is gonna be on your helmet this season and why did you choose that? Um, no, I have, I think, you know, we, uh, we always design it in different ways and uh, whatever comes to you, but I felt, uh, you know, from what I've been through and what I've done over the last uh, year and a half, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, advertising pretty much, you know, it's, uh, so I just, choose to put the hashtag same here on my mask I think uh, again just to kind of get the conversation forward and uh, have it more visible and uh, I believe in that organization and what it's trying to do so I felt right okay um, Heather what can be the benefits of a person in Robin's position you know publicly uh, speaking for a cause or in this obvious particular case uh, for honesty around mental health I think, you know, it's a big problem not only in sports but just in society of the stigma around mental health issues um, because it's not something you can see, right? You know, you break a bone, you know, it's, it's, you can do an x-ray, you can see it, you know, everyone accepts it, but it's, it's subjective, you know, when no one can see the depression or the anxiety um, or even what's happening in your brain unless you do a, you know, MRI scan. And so the, the, that's somebody who people respect who's, you know, at the top of his game, literally, um, can come out and, and say, hey, look, I have this issue. I'm still, you know, doing what I do. And people look up to him. Um, and it's just part of sort of breaking down, chipping away at that stigma piece by piece when people, high profile people come out and, and say, you know, this is who I am and are open about it instead of trying to hide it, which actually just causes more stress and anxiety and worsens the situation. Um, again, I don't know how many close hockey fans we have out there, but last year the Islanders were one of the biggest success stories in the NHL. Um, best season they'd had in 20 years, I believe. Um, and Robin was a big part of it, and uh, he was a free agent after the season. And, you know, again, at, at a kind of surface level, the analysis was that you know, the Islanders lowballed him, um, didn't make a market, you know, the right hockey decision in the contract they did or did not offer him. And as a consequence, Robin Lehner is now a goalie for the Chicago Blackhawks. Um, again, some people that are a little closer to it, and Robin has addressed it, I believe, um, but I would love to hear you say it to the room. Do, do you feel that, um, I know an example Eric has given, like, do you think if you were coming back from a knee injury, um, maybe you would be viewed at face value and get a great contract extension, but it, instead your injury uh, or your background is one of bipolar, of addiction, which you have tackled, faced, rehabbed from. Do you think that that impacted the negotiations and kind of your market value, you know, what, what, what is the impact of that in your opinion? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a tough question, but I mean, it obviously it did. Uh, this is the thing I talk about a lot of the time. I think we as a society, we, in no matter what we're, we're looking at, it's politics or if it's uh, big pharma or if it's gun control or whatever it might be, you know, like the answer is right in front of us, but we're taught not to look at it the, the way it really is. And um, that's just the way we're programmed, unfortunately. And, um, I said it from the day one when I came out with a story and uh, talked about all my uh, 
uh, all my problems, all my issues, you know, it's going to have a financial impact uh, on, on my career. It's going to have a severe risks and I knew that from the get-go and I was still fine with it because I knew that was the right path for me and my rehabilitation plan to get better. And uh, um, th th it's a sensitive issue, uh, question too because, you know, the, the GM of the Islanders, Lou Lamarillo, respect him probably more than I respect, uh, respect a lot of people and he's a tremendous person. But I don't look down at what, what happened on him. It's, that's just the way the society and uh, the social s the structure in the corpor uh, corporate world works. As soon as you show any type of weakness, you get punished for it. That's why we have this tremendously backward society that creates mental health in a broad spectrum. Because we are forced to hide all of our things, lie on our resumes, lie about who we are, be around people every day, be in a person you're not. And it, it, it spirals away and it, uh, it, it makes us sick. Over a long time, it's a little, small little poison that grows in you, and it's uh, when you get issues, it spirals you away, and you treat it with uh, alcohol, you treat it with pills, you treat it with whatever you can get a hold of, bad behaviors, or, uh, and I came out with a story, and uh, you know, I thought that it was going to go a little bit different, but I was, I also came into the free agency looking at, you know, I've been sober for 14, 15 months, you know, like if it's long-term, short-term, I'm fine with both, but it was going to be a fast process, and I'm just going to be honest on exactly how it was, because I have nothing to hide, and it's not to bash anyone about it. I don't feel bad about it. I don't tell it to, to get any sympathies, because I'm in a pretty good place. You know, I'm, I got a new contract uh, in a new, a pretty great club, and I love the Islanders, but we were going to get a deal done fast, and we, we we were talking the whole year about the thing. We really hope it's going to work out. We really hope it's going to work out, and we're going to, you know, take care of you and all that stuff, you know. And uh, we had two different perception of what taking care of you was, and that's okay. You can disagree about certain things, but I was fine with a short term. I was fine with a long term. But it's tough when you've been told it's going to a negotiation is going to happen fast, and then after a week nothing happens. After two weeks nothing happens, and then you've been told that from the ownership level you need they need a uh, due diligence, a due diligence on me. And I said, that's fine, that's no problem. I even signed all the waivers, they got all my medical history, you know, I have nothing to hide, even though everyone told me not to do it. And um, two months went by, nothing happens. Not an offer, no nothing. Um, and a shell award happens, you know, we, something was gonna get done, no offer still. And then all of a sudden, you know, it comes to the week of the deadline and we're presented an offer that we don't think is very good two-year offer that wasn't very good. Uh, uh, not where I thought I deserved compared to what I've shown them over a year on how like, strong my rehabilitation is and all the extra things that I go through to make sure that I'm, uh, I'm healthy. And I even, I really wish that we could have changed the CBA a little bit and put a clause in the contract that I put the risk on me. You know, if I relapse again or if something goes sideways, they can cut me, no problem. It's gonna be on me, but unfortunately, CBA doesn't work like that. Um, so what happens is, uh, you know, I get an offer, and then the next couple of days, you know, I, I get an ultimatum that I gotta make a decision in the next two hours. And I didn't think that was the best way forward. I don't think I deserved that, and especially after I've been waiting for two and a half months. So, I mean, I didn't give an answer. And then they said that they were going to move forward, and they moved forward, and I still waited, and that's what happened. And there's no ill judgments towards it, and because I understand that's how society works, that's how, you know, everyone's been taught and how things work. You know, it's risk and reward, and it's not looking at, it's, it's a negotiation tactic. That's why people are not honest in societies, because if I say that I have a problem in whatever it might be, it's going to be held against you, and it's just how it works. And that's why, you know, fighting with the alliance I joined, it's really important that more and more people talk about it and normalize it because we all deal with something. And it's so explosive. I say I have bipolar and most people are so uneducated about what bipolar is. They think it's, oh, it's a crazy person. It's gonna do all of, all of, what is this, this mysterium? But it's, it's really not. No one can pick me out of a crowd when, when I'm manic. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's just not how it works. There's so many wrong, perception about mental health and, and life in general, and it's a big problem. I think, yeah, I mean, there's, in working in 
the mental health field, and I'm a neuroscientist and psychologist and work with patients and treatment, but there, there, is no, there is no normal, right? This idea that there's something like everyone else is normal, like everybody is somewhere on a dimension of, of something. And when it gets really extreme, you know, there's no black and white line when something all of a sudden is disordered. Just when it starts to really interfere with your daily life, then we label it as something and then treat it. But there is no normal. And if and either you're affected by some sort of, whether it's depression, anxiety, you know, you get bipolar, whatever it is, or you know somebody who is, right? It is very, very common. And when we accept that, instead of trying to um, say, imagine this imaginary normal that doesn't exist, that nobody could ever attain, and then you punish people who don't achieve this imaginary thing, it, 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 first of all, financially speaking, it doesn't make sense. So People are making these emotional decisions like, oh, that person is, you know, messed up. Whereas if you actually were open about it and allowed people to talk about it instead of forcing them to bottle it up and then they explode in some other way, like what happened with Ron Artiste and, you know, attacking, um, you know, people in the stands, you know, in the long run, that's going to be cost more money, right? And, and be more of a detriment than actually letting people be open about it, talk about it, get treatment they need, and you'll get the most, um, if it's an organization or a corporation looking for how much value they can get or you know, out of a player, you're gonna get the most out of them if you, if you break away from the stigma. So I think it's just if people can shift the perspective and how they're looking at mental illness, rather than saying, oh, that's a bad thing, and we should just, people should, players learn to hide it. You know, they, we give them, I give players, we test players with, um, whether they can go back into a game after they've had a concussion. You know, we give them this, this personality test, a neurocognitive test, and, and they, can, they can fake it to go back into the game, right? They can fake good, we call it. Um, so that's, that's not helping anybody, right? That's not helping the player, and it's not helping the, the, the league because you're sending people back in who really maybe shouldn't be sent back in or you know, need more time to recover or need some mental health help. So if everyone could just be honest, I think it would, be, it would benefit everyone. It would benefit the team, it would benefit the players. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's a, it's a difficult subject because as we talked before too, you know, like uh, there's a difference between how it works and what society accepts. It's uh, it's how it is. It's uh, like if we talk about concussions, we can talk about it for a long time. I faked con like I faked. I was I played through concussions. You know, I uh, just uh, hit it with a lot of alcohol. You know, because I had migraines for months, and the only time I didn't have migraines was when I drank beer. Um, and you know, you get the concussion, and you you go away, and you stay by yourself, and you don't get that much uh, that much help, and you know, when you're out of the game, you're out of the game. You know, when you're rehabbing, you're rehabbing away from your players. You're being hidden away from the players. You know, the system is, the system is kind of broken that way. And um, the, 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 per, the, the perception there you talk about is, uh, it's, it's tough to break down because, uh, um, again, it's, it's all about the culture, the culture of society it's uh, started from the corporate structure, and the corporate structure doesn't accept weakness. So that you, we create uh, all these young people going through school, you know, you gotta show perfection, you can't say who you are, you can't say what you go through, but we're all going through it. Logically, we all know that we're going through a bunch of shit, you know? We, we all know that uh, life is not perfect, and you know, as we talked uh, before, you know, like, I love this country, I love to spend the rest of my life in this country, but it has some deep flaws, you know? It's, you guys talk about the college uh, debts and stuff, and I think it's hilarious because I, I look, I look at a country that sends sends its whole youth into guaranteed mental health issues that leads to addiction, alcohol abuse, drug abuse, and suicide. End of story. It's just the truth because long periods of time under financial stress is one of the leading causes to anxiety, depression, bipolar, and all of these things, and we know it, but we don't talk about it. How insane is it? How insane is it? I mean, people going through relationship issues or divorce or a traumatic thing in their life, you know, see someone die or, you know, close one dies or anything, you know, it's obviously it affects your mental health. And, you know, you have all these mental health uh, movements that's, or that say they have statistics. What statistics? What statistics are they talking about? Because, you know, from what I know, there's not a, you know, you, you, people talk about there's uh, polls and there's this and there's that. You know, how do you know what statistics of, of a country is mentally ill when most of the people are undiagnosed and are taught not to say what they are? How are you going to know how many people are bipolar when most people don't say that there's anything wrong with them and they're hiding all their, sh all their stuff? 
it's a bigger percentage of the population that have different issues than what people are talking about. And then we have a society that's created a structure around it to punish the people that actually are talking about it. And that's where it comes into my story. I knew that the only way forward, because when I was at rehab, in rehab, they say you got to bring the people around you. You know, you got to be open and honest with them, and they're going to be a part of your journey, right? But in the NHL or in any any type of sports organization, it's all about you got to be quiet. You can't you can't tell anyone what you're going through. You can't you you can't tell any of your teammates. You got to keep this a secret. So I'm thinking to myself, like this, how's this going to work? It's not going to work for me. I'm not going to. I'm going to relapse 100%. I'm not going to be able to get better if I do this. Transparency is the only way forward, and it was the only way forward. And the pro NHL program, the my lawyer, my agents, everyone told me you got to be quiet. Don't say anything. I told them all to shut up. You know, because you're pretty much telling me not to go and get better. You know, because I told my GM straight up. I'm, you know, like, I have all these issues, I've been drinking in the past, I've been take, uh, taking drugs, you know, I have all these problems in my past, my youth, my, my early teens, uh, or my early 20s, all these things, you know, obviously not everything, but quite a bit. But I created a trust with him. I created a, a trust where when I said what I've done from that point going forward and all the walls and all the barriers that I, and boundaries that I've set and all in my rehab plan, he also trusts me that I was telling the truth. And that's, all of a sudden, if no one in my team know that I'm an alcoholic and I have problems drinking, I could have picked up the beer whenever I wanted if they didn't know about it. But when I'm with them and I would have picked up a beer, I would have had a person there say, what, what are you doing? You know, I'm, we're taught to have the family and people around us be a part of the process, but the, the reality of life is your family is with you for a majority of the time, but if you're in a working place, the majority of the time I spend is with my teammates. It's with my teammates, it's with my co coaches, it's with my organization, and you're asking me not to, uh, to have them around, uh, around me as, a, as the protection. I'm not asking them to hold my hand or do anything for me or do any extra work or hire extra people or anything. I'm asking them around me to be open and honest with themselves because you know when I was honest with all my teammates uh, this year, I have a tr tremendous amount of teammates that could talk to me about it and came and asked, uh, asked me for, for different help. And I had people around the league ask me for help because you normalize it because that's how things work. If you normalize it, people are going to open up. But if I go and project on you, you're going to be quiet. Yeah. Can you speak to the impact that you, you either know or can imagine it has on a fan or a teammate that you are an active athlete? You're doing it. You're performing at the highest level. You were one of the, you know, let's say... 10 best goalies on the entire planet last year while also being honest and open and transparent as opposed to, again, not the understood why a player would wait till after to discuss anything controversial or that might hurt their earnings, but you're doing it live. Do you have any anecdotes about things people have said to you or thanked you or just, you know, the, the, the power that comes from, from you doing that for, for fans and teammates? Um, I mean, I think, uh, I think, uh, as I said, I think it's a big part of my journey and my my re rehabilitation plan to be the, with the open uh, openness and honesty because it really helps me. And I think uh, service is a big part of my rehabilitation too. Helping other people helps myself. And but I have seen tremendous amount of out uh, uh, outpour, yeah, uh, from from people. And uh, I've gotten a lot of messages. I've. Uh, seen huge interaction with a lot of people not just fans but also people around the league and that's the funny part you know I get executives from other teams come down and grab me it's like yeah you know I'm bipolar too you know but yeah, I take all these things you know I'm like good for you why what's what you know he can't be open about it I've met so many people that come to me and it's open yeah I take the same medications as you I'm like yeah I, you know I came out of rehab I was on 10 medications I was like a ghost I'm like Phew. What's going on here, you know? But, you know, me doing my self-education, I've gotten, you know, trying to involve people in uh, real time about what I do and, and what, the, what the process is, it's, it's, it, it, it has a big impact on, on things. But again, I took a, it's a risk and reward for me too. I knew the risks of being open and honest, and I've seen, uh, and I've, I've been punished by it 100%. If I say 
if I say I'm not or that I believe I'm not, maybe I'm not right, but that's what I believe. Uh, and uh, but it's worth it to me because if we, we talk about it, you know, the first one through the wall gets bloody. That's what the, we, we, we've talked about in our, uh, our alliance. And if I get bloody being one of the first one through the wall, that's fine with me because eventually maybe the next one and the third one and the 10th one is bloody too, but maybe eventually it's not a problem anymore. Maybe people can change this culture of how things work and people realize that a lot of the things in society and the corporate world and corporate structure, if we can change that and we can put mental health education into schools, we're going to change violence in the country, in, in the world. We're going to change a lot of the issues. We're going to change the opioid crisis, change the addiction that, that, uh, that we have. We're going to change the depression amongst the youth that's skyrocketing right now and anxiety problems and all of these things. We, we're not educated about it. And that's what happens in rehab, you know? You go to rehab, you know, you detox and all that things, that's fine, but then you download all your, your background and history, you know, you talk to the therapist, and that's fine too, it has its perks, but for me, you know, it was, you know, you start getting directed into certain ways and you start reading about all the symptoms, uh, all the symptoms in all these different categories, like bipolar, ADHD, you know, major depression, and you, you start seeing all these things, what they are and what, uh, behavioral traits and what, what you do and, and, and you start associating yourself you're like, Psh, definitely got ADHD. I fit everything on the, on the bipolar. That's exactly what I do when I'm manic. You know, dude, I spend a bunch of extra money. I don't care about the, any liabilities. You know, like I'm impulsive. I do, you know, I'm obsessive like no one else in the world, you know, and but also helped me in my game. You know, when I was manic, I was not, never got tired. I practiced for days, you know, it's a, uh, it's uh, when I start realizing all those things, I, I start questioning things, I start reading about things. Self education is incredibly important because, unfortunately, society is creating a system that's just a factory. You know, people into the psychiatrist, here you go, get your Xanax, get out of here. You know, like you need to be able to question things. Like, I have people in around me that I talk, talk to the things, it's perfectly normal to give their three kids. Uh, Ativan and Sanex. They're 15 years old. Ben people don't know benzos is one of the, it's the only drug you can die from detoxing on. And alcohol. But we, and the same with Ambience. Ambience, I was on Ambience for eight years. They gave me my first, uh, uh, my first prescription of Ambien when I was 19 years old, broke into the league. As many refills as you want, no problem. It's worse in the beginning of my career than was after, but find out I go to rehab, you know, I haven't had REM sleep in eight years. When I got detoxed, I was constant. I was dreaming for a month straight. I was walking around my room, seeing, seeing things, you know, like one night I was on my computer the whole night in rehab, and I was doing a bunch of cool things on the computer until I knew I had no fucking computer. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know? <laughs> No, but it's, it's like, I asked my psych, I asked the doctors here, they're like, you're catching up on REM sleep. You, you, you're, it's, uh, it's, it's just crazy what we socially accept as how, how to do things. You know, same when I went through, my, uh, went through my surgery, I got addicted to opioids pretty quick. I was in a bad part of my life. I have a lot of problems and baggage. Went through surgery on my ankle, got morphine in my uh, hospital bed, and I felt pretty good. Felt pretty good. I had no issues at that time, I tell you that. And then I get out of the hospital, and I get, I get Vicodin, Oxycontin, Valiums, all these things, and a month's prescription. And, you know, doctors obviously ask you, are you feeling better? How's the pain? The pain is terrible. It's god-awful. I need, I need more. And what, what are they going to say? We're, we're NHL players. Are they going to say no? No. And all of a sudden, you know, I've taken that for, for a month, and you're hooked. It's just, uh, you, you, you know, you're, you're not only hooked to the like actual pills, but you're hooked to the feeling. You're hooked of not having no problems, having no issues. And it's, it's sad because, you know, like I had, I had, uh, I had two kids at the, I had two kids at the time, you know, but uh, it's so powerful, mental health, you know, with depression and stuff like that. You don't care about anything. And it's hard for people that hasn't gone through depression to understand how that is. It's really hard to to understand, but society makes it so easy, it makes it so easy to fall into these uh, holes because now what's working for me is I'm being so uh, 
interactive with my psychiatrist. I ask them questions. I ask about other medication. I ask about health, uh, like organic things. I ask about CBT, DBT things. You know, even I start talking about psychedelics. You know, like about all, all the different spectrum of things because you have to question things, but you need to educate yourself. You need to be educated about the subjects to be able to make the right choices. I mean, if my psychiatrist asked me, how do you feel on Seroquel? God awful. I couldn't function for a week when I took Seroquel, but it's important for me to have. If I go manic, I need that pill for a day or two to kind of calm down. But if I can't tell my psychiatrist how I feel, how are we gonna make good, uh, good decisions? But right now, that's not how it works. I'm lucky because I'm in the NHL, so I get the best care. There's everyone else that don't have it like me. I can't even imagine, and it makes me sad because that's how it is. You know, you get your you get your Xanax, you get your painkillers, you get your this. You know, you get no help. So what do you do? You self-medicate because you don't know better. You're not educated. We've not been taught on how to do things. I think there's there's a number of problems. I mean, first you have the stigma and recognizing that it's a biological. Um, they're bi biological diseases, right? Mental illness. But then once you accept that, then it becomes, oh, how do you treat it? And there's fully a problem with over-medicalization, over-medication. Over um, and I think the, a pill is not the cure, right? Sometimes there is an actual neurochemical imbalance and you need something to help sort of modulate that just to get a person well enough to be amenable to therapy, right? And it's, a pill alone doesn't do anything. And then, and also they can be misused, like in the case of opioids in many cases. But usually it's just um, the, using some medication plus some therapy has a synergistic effect. They work together to help. No, I mean, yeah. that, that, that's what I preach. I'm not against the pharmaceuticals in, in a whole. I'm against how it's, been, how it's being done, how it's being commercialized, and how one pill cures all. It's just not true. And they know it's not true, but they <laughs> still do it. And we as a population, we let them. Unfortunately, we, it's our fault because we are the many and they are the few. But we, we don't rise up. We don't care enough. And that's just uh, how it is. But I see the medications. I need the medications uh, to get to neutral so I can work on myself and actually function because I cannot work when I'm depressed. I can tell you that much. You know, uh, it, people say, you know, you got to fight through it. You got to be disciplined and all that stuff. Try telling a depressed person to be disciplined. It doesn't work. You know, it's, you need that help to get to neutral. And when you're at neutral, you can start making progress. But you have to make progress. You have to do all the research. You have to work on yourself. And when you're at neutral, that's when you set up your walls, your emergency breaks, and start, uh, start doing things. And that brings, brings me into what we talked about earlier, too. It's when you are in some type of mental health state, anxiety, depression, you know, whatever it might be, because of how the culture is that you have to hide everything, that is what spirals things out of control. And I always bring this up, what I had with my wife, because it's the best example I have, is before I went to rehab and I went into depression and, uh, and all that stuff, you know, I always, you know, I start feeling tired, you know, I, I, I felt useless, I had no purpose, you know, whatever it might be, but, you know, I try to hide from my wife, my kids, you know, like I try to, you don't make excuses, you know, like I try to not spend time with them because, you know, I couldn't. But what happens is because that's how I went about it back then, a very powerful thing happens and that's called guilt. When guilt hits you, you're done. You spiral all the way to the bottom. The guilt and sadness and all these things that happens uh, because you don't know how to go about it and then you go down to deeper and deeper and deeper depression. What, what happens now is, if I go into depression now, and I start feeling, feeling the same thing, I go to my wife, I'm like, I don't feel good right now. I don't feel good today. I think you're starting a bad week or something, you know, and she's like, it's fine, you know, take your time, do whatever you want. So, okay, I stay at that level. I don't go down. So next day, I'm actually up again, neutral. Because I have honestly, and, uh, and uh, I'm honest with, with, my, with my partner now. And again, go back to transparency and honesty. It helps you. But if you bring that into society is, say we have a person that's anxious, you know, if he has to go into a room and pretend he's something he's not and constantly tell himself something wrong with you, something wrong with you, you can't show who you really are. What happens? It gets worse and worse and worse. So again, this cultural cultural uh, uh, and uh, this, how society works, it makes people worse automatically. If you open up uh, in, a, in a team or in a room or in a corporation that it's okay to have these things because we all have it. 
different degrees, different things, or you might hit it, you know, and you can be open and honest about it without being punished that you can't take the next step as a lawyer, you can't be partner as a lawyer, you can't go and be a CEO. But the funny thing is, now when I'm open and honest, I actually talk to a lot of CEOs and all these high ups, and they all have the issues. They all have a lot of these issues because when you got to be a really successful person, you usually are really weak in one place that makes you really strong in another area. So a lot of these really successful people actually have some really big weaknesses, but they hide them. They hide them. And that's why I like the Same Here movement because we're trying to get a bunch of successful people in all the different spaces, tell their stories, be active about it, and all of a sudden you can show everyone that it's possible to be at a, higher a high level of performance and still have these issues like we all know we have. I think it's important to break the dichotomy because right now there's this dichotomy between what's healthy for you as a human, as an individual, is to be open and to let people know and to have social support and accountability and all of that, um, but that, that's butting up against success in your career. Right, so it's like you have to make this choice between like I'm going to do what's best for me and my mental health versus what's best for my career. Because if I show all these weaknesses, there's going to be punishment. So if we can somehow break down that stigma, then people can do what's best for their mental health and be open and honest, not get worse. Yeah, you no, know, that, and, but that's what I'm saying with yeah. me first. Just like I am naturally a lot healthier, just not hiding anything, right. guaranteed. You know, coming in here and being totally honest, you guys. I can tell you guys whatever about my dark past. There's a few things that I won't say, but the majority of it, I feel pretty free. It helps my anxiety. It, you know, like, we talk about it all the time, you know. It's, when, you, when you have to hide things it's, uh, and you can't be yourself, we t I sit and listen to the, the talks before here today, you know, as a, you know t t talking about gay people, for, ex for example. Because society hasn't let them be who they are, how tough is it for, for a gay person to hide who they really are? It creates, it's the same exact concept as be, the mental health uh, problem. If you can't be who you are around the people you're around all the time, it's going to create issues. And that's the problem with, the, with society, that we, we, we're not allowed to tell who we are. And it, 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 it explodes eventually. There was a you know, really high profile situation just last week that you, you brought up in the in the green room of a NFL quarterback, Andrew Luck, um, you know, retiring mostly for physical ailments, but I'm sure there was an element of protecting his mental health. And, you know, there was some, I guess, some warm reaction from a few corners, but there was some very critical media. There were fans booing. Um, I mean, you're not a football player, but you play a physical sport. I mean, could you just talk about what that looked like to you as basically a peer in terms yeah. of age and per playing, a, playing a very physical pro sport and ha how you viewed his decision and the reaction to it? Yeah, no, I, mixed reactions. Uh, I Personally, I was really, really happy when I saw him do it. I thought it was a great step forward and someone finally, you know, took care of you know, his well-being, and I give him a lot of credit for it. I don't know much about his personal situation or what it might have been, but I think it was the uh, best decision he could make for himself, but it also made me really angry with how the perception of everything is, because it doesn't matter if you have $1 billion in your account or if you, if, if you don't. It doesn't matter if you're famous or not. Mental health hits you the exact same way. It just, it just does. And I'm not, again, I don't know his mental health situation. I'm not saying he was or not, but... I, I'm educated around the subject because I've been through rehab. I've seen countless of my, my friends been through rehab, and we are programmed as athletes to be in a routine, be with our friends, be with our teammates, and you know, go, go, through, go through all the things you need to do. And when you're out of it, the teams don't want you around. They want you to be there early, be out early, you know, not be around the, the, the other team. When you're injured, you're gone. And it's incredibly hard on your mental state to go through rehab. And I can't imagine going through three years of rehab, what he did. As I said, when I had my concussion, what happened? I drank. When I had my, when I had my ankle surgery, I got hooked on opioids. And I've seen countless of people go into huge depressions through rehab. And then you got these people in the media. And the media is a huge problem about this, uh, about this, this stigma and how things really work. You know, you got this guy at Fox News, what is his name? <laughs> Gottlieb, Gottlieb, he comes out with one tweet, and he thinks it's a very innocent tweet, right? It says, 
it's the most millennial it's most millennial thing to you know retire over rehabbing for three years and then he comes out with a five minute segment about like kind of explaining it and saying that the, uh, you know I just that's how I am I, I talk like that and just trying to make it okay what he doesn't understand is let's let's be honest he called him a he, he called him a pussy you know he just said he, you know he's he, he's a weak person you know like oh rehab boo hoo you know you make a lot of money and now you're quitting like that's basically what he's saying and again and then he uh, goes in and say, well, back in the day, that would never happen. You know, they, they were tougher back in the day. Yeah, sure. All those guys back in the day, they're committing suicide right now. <laughs> you know, so it's just that the topic has changed. And now there, 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 there are so many of these at, uh, athletes that I've been around have huge problems after their career. They're the addicts, they're depressed, they have no relationship anymore, they have all the issues, you know, all the fame goes away and all, all these things. It's huge, it's a tough situation. So if you don't take care of yourself when you, when you can, it's a big chance that you're gonna die. There's a, that's another interesting issue is the like effect of fame on mental health and suddenly getting famous and rich and when you're already coming into it with some mental health issues, all it can do is exacerbate things because um, now suddenly you're getting all this adulation. You know, sometimes rules don't apply to you and you can get away with things maybe you couldn't otherwise get away with. And then when the if the fame suddenly goes away or you're dropped or you don't get picked up or you have to, you know, take a break the effects that that can have. So anything, so so I think it's unique to, to people in the entertainment industry and, and in um, high profile sports. It's, it's, it can be significantly um, enhance or, or, or worsen the, the mental health um, symptoms um, just by being thrust into the limelight like that and then taken suddenly out of it as well. And I think that that's not taken into an account at all. Um, and, and then the effect of media and, you know, being high profile and people tweeting about you and negative tweets and all of that. Yeah, but, why, you know, why should we care, you know? Why, why, why should we cry? We made so much money. Well, no, no, I mean, no yeah. but it, it's, it, that's the perception. We made so much money, you know? So we have no issues, you know? Like, we, we always compare each other to things. And, you know, again, you know, athletes and politicians, CEOs, everyone, you know, you put people in pockets and you think you know about them, but we're all the same. We're all the same. I, I know a lot of athletes are a lot more cocky, you know, and uh, have another persona and, and whatever, but that's their defense mechanism. That's how they've been taught to, through their whole life, you know. That's how you, we made the team, you know. We convinced ourselves we were the best in the world. We, 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 we really, uh, we, we became narcissists, you know, over a long period of time. And, um, but it's a big, it's a big issue uh, because we get uh, used to that fame and all that help and, uh, we get also a lot more freedom, you know. It's not hard for me to get drugs in a club, I tell you that, you know. It, it's, uh, uh, I've, I've honestly been a part, you know, t doing, seeing guys getting busted by the same guards that was do, uh, doing drugs, but taking their drugs and giving them to me. How crazy is that? It's, it's, we, we get a lot of easy access to do a bunch of, a bunch of stuff and unfortunately, you know, we think uh, certain people don't do certain things because we're athletes or whatnot. We're the same as everyone else and everyone else deals with issues and we deal with the same issues, but we do it in different levels and in different, in different things and that's just the reality of it and sometimes it can be even harder because, you know, you go up and have all that fame and all of a sudden it's gone. All of a sudden it's gone. And, you know, when you've actually tasted something and it's taken away from you, it's, it can be pretty tough. Um, you, you guys, you guys, NHL players, mo most professional athletes do have unions that have some level of power. Um, do, do you see any chance where, um, you know, as a bargaining chip, perhaps, you know, where, where mental health or, or treatment of this these issues becomes raised because as you've said, it, the teams probably aren't gonna put the players first. The teams are a business um, and players are probably more focused on salary cap or mid-level salary, but do you think there could be a time in the maybe near future um, where that, where enough players at least anonymously said to the leadership, you know, we would like um, mental health care or the way that rehab players are treated. Like, you know, could, could you see that becoming part of a negotiation so that the, the conditions around it, that did 
Yeah, did it improve? I, yeah, no, I, I can see small things uh, changing here and there. I, I mean, I, I went to Chicago, and Chicago has two mental health specialists in the team, and it was uh, incredibly nice to see that, you know, and uh, non-linked to management, stuff like that. But, I mean, that's the first step. As I said, again, I believe there's a few key components uh, to, to change the whole, the, 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 the whole conception of everything. It's, it's uh, the culture uh, of the corporate structure and not, and not being punished and everyone realizes we're all actually dealing with a bunch of stuff and we're, we're all actually pretty, pretty equal. If you look at society, as I said, about the college debt and you know, opioid crisis and all this stuff, it's so many people that do it. So if we can just be honest and stop with the bullshit and be, punish each other for, we have CEOs punishing under ones for having the same issues that the actor CEO has because that's a structure that's in place. If we change those things, Things will go move forward. As I said, me in Long Island last year, when when I opened up, you know, being open and honest, it changes things. So if more and more people can do it without being punished, eventually, if maybe it happens next year or hundred years, I don't know. But if, if if it can get there eventually, we're gonna be a lot more healthy. All of us is gonna be a lot more healthy. But there are small things as you know, putting mental health speci specialists within the team, because that's the most fun, uh, funny thing I've said to, I said it to the GMs, said it to the GM in, in Chicago, I'm like, the sports teams put their own words on mental, mental illness, so you get new young guys into a team, and they're great, skilled, they're great in practice, they impress everyone, but then they go into a game, and they can't perform. And the team's like, ah, he's not the clutch, you know, he's not the, he can't handle the pressure, you know, and then he gets flipped out, and I'm saying, okay, so you're saying he's nervous, I say yes, Performance anxiety is anxiety. But we don't use those terms. We don't look at it that way. We just go, go, go. Uh, you're, you're done. Instead of, as I said, a lot of public speakers, a lot of the most successful public speakers, what do they do? They take Enderol. They take Enderol. It's a, it's a blood pressure medication before they speak. So they can speak. Because they're nervous as everyone else, but they take these pills. I mean, I'm not saying that the hockey players should start taking these pills because of the performance anxiety. What I'm saying is there's a performance anxiety thing. It's not about a nervous or a clutch thing. It's about, you know, at the limelight, they might need help, certain, is a certain help to kind of get to where they need to be. But right now, it's like either you can do it or you cannot. So you flush out a lot of talent in, in, in those aspects. And I go into a hockey team or I go into being around a bunch of people, but I can talk about hockey because that's what I'm in. I see in every team, a big, a lot of people have OCD, undiagnosed OCD. They have to have everything perfect everywhere. They get pissed off and they, they can't let go of it. They make minor mistakes and all this stuff. Like, and you know, they do a mistake in a game. They can't let it go until three weeks later because they're such perfectionists. Like, let's call it as it is. They have OCD, and you see ADHD, you see anxiety, depression. You see it all around in the teams, but you know. We don't attack it that way. We don't even look at it at a broad spectrum that it is possible or it is true that we all have a lot of these issues undiagnosed because we, we have protected ourselves to get to that place as athletes by not saying we have issues. So we cannot tell anyone that we have these, uh, uh, these uh, illnesses or try to even look at them. It's just not possible because we get punished by it. But what happens if we take it one step further away from hockey? What happens like a company like Google, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of employees, and if you're being truly honest and logic about it, a huge percentage of your company struggles with all these small things like anxiety, dep uh, depression, uh, ADHD, OCD, you know, whatever it might be, right? And they're still functioning because we as human beings, we can function through our problems because we all have problems and we still function. But what if we change the culture within a company like that in some type of manner where it's so socially accepted to have these issues and actually try to, I'm not asking for mental health days, I'm not asking to hire a bunch of people for them, I'm not asking, but changing the culture where you don't get punished is a good first step because they're gonna self-rehabilitate within the company. They're gonna find people to talk to because it's gonna be more an open climate. And the biggest rehabilitation happens between me and my friends and Eric when I talk to him for three hours about things. I feel better afterwards when I have a long conversation with you. I feel good afterwards, you self, you, you know, when you can open things up, all of a sudden, maybe 20, 30, 40, 50 percent of a company can get the help they need and get better. How much better is that company going to be? How much better is that team going to be? How much better is the society going to be? And that goes back to the, uh, the 
uh, with the students and with the education, education about uh, mental health and all that stuff, all of a sudden, you know, people go through between 15 and 24. That's where a lot of the uh, mental, mental problems start. So if you can capture that window and really educate everyone about all, all the different uh, illnesses that you can develop or, uh, you know, mood swings and, and, and all those things and how you can actually help yourself and get the right help with it and show all the symptoms so you, because you have to make the decision. I can't tell you that you need to go and get help. You won't get help. You need to yourself decide, I want to fix this thing, you know? And if we get to that point, it's going to be a lot healthier population out there and it's going to be a lot of these issues are going to be f flushed down by a huge percentage. One thing I just want to add to that, which is such an important point, just from like a scientific perspective and a treatment perspective is that, and I'm saying this as a therapist, somebody who, you know, does talk therapy, um, that it helps, and then there's studies that look at, like, why does it help? They, they look at the different types of talk therapy, you know, like psychoanalysis, cognitive behavioral therapy, and all the different techniques. And when they subtract out all that, they find that regardless of the technique, the main therapeutic element is what we call the therapeutic alliance, which is really just the relationship between the doctor and the patient, which means that it's not even the actual technique that they're doing that's necessarily having the biggest effect. It's just that the person is open and having a conversation, which is why I thought it was so important when you said it's not just, you don't have to hire therapists and no, for but a that's, team. That's can, the thing because but the openness can allow you to just talk no, to friends it's, and it's, colleagues. It's, it's, and it's probably the, one of the biggest things in my whole rehabilitation is being able to be open. That's my whole point of things. Be open and honest with people I spend time with. Because you go through whoever sits here in the, uh, in, in the audience, you go from your best friend to your friend to your outer light and friends. What's the difference? Your best friend is the one you've been most honest with. You created trust. You know, you can, you, you uh, share your vulnerability. That's why you're your best friend. That's why you have your wife, you know, like it's deeper connection of intimacy and openness about your flaws, right? And if you can normalize it a little bit and make sure that, you know, you can still be open. I'm not saying like, you know, if you, I'm not saying you should go out and give everyone your medical history, but if you know that it's okay to talk about your medical history, you're gonna be able to choose that time because when you're gonna take that step to go and get help, I wanted to get help for years. And why didn't I get help? It's because you're on this really, really fine line where you're like, you're, you're assessing the situation, you're assessing the risk, you're assessing the per, uh, perception of what everyone thinks of you, and all of a sudden you hear something from a teammate, like, like I heard like three years ago when I wanted to get help, I heard one guy's like, alcoholism is a choice. It's a choice, it's about being disciplined. That's just how it works, it's not a disease. And when I heard him talk about that in the locker room, I'm like, Shh, I'm not gonna get, go, go and say anything, you know? And, you know, when you hear the stigma around a lot of these things, when you're balancing on that fine line, that's what decides if you're gonna get help or not. And I know a lot of people are in the same situation. What is my family member gonna think? What's my fiance gonna, gonna think? What's my employer gonna think if I go and get help? And that's what makes the choice for you if you're gonna get help or not, in the majority of cases. So if you open that up and that is okay, you know, all these mental, a lot of mental health organization, I respect what everyone does to try and to help help the movement, right? But like, as I said to Eric, and I can be open and honest about that, his name, the all a little bit crazy name, is the worst name in the world, and I hate it. You know, like, well, and I say that to him. So I'm the same here guy, that's what I associate with, but there's other mental health organizations like fight for your, fight for your health, fight for your happiness. I mean, try to say to a depressed person, fight for your happiness. You're pretty much saying you're not fighting if you're sick. You can't fight, you gotta outsmart it. You gotta get to the medicine and get to the neutral and, and put in the brakes and all that stuff. You can't say fight for your happiness, you know? It doesn't work in mental health that way. And then you have the bell let's talk, you know? You're pretty much saying the healthy people go and talk to the sick people. And how does that work in reality? I'm gonna come, if, you're, if I think that you're sick, I'm gonna come and project myself as I am the healthy one, please tell me about your stuff. <laughs> It's never going to work. How it worked in reality is I'm dealing with this stuff. I've been a drug abuser. I've drank, for, I've drank and taken sleeping pills for eight years. I've done a tremendous amount of bad in my life. And, you know, I've struggled economically. I've struggled with all of these different, different things, you know. And when I can be open and honest about that, all of a sudden, a trust opens up. And she all of a sudden might not have any of those things. But then she says, well, I have an eating disorder, you know. 
Okay, well, and then you start talking about it because right now in society, it's like two walls talking together. That's what the conversation is. Hey, how are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm good, a good talk. <laughs> you know, that's, that's what we're taught to say because we're taught not to say anything bad. Yeah. It's, uh, it's how it works. Um, really great stuff, I know people in the audience will have some questions. Yeah, so. we're, we're getting up. Uh, yeah, we're hands are going up as fast. As many as we can, yeah. Uh, but yeah, we're running out of time, so let's keep it Robin, I'm just going to make this short and sweet. First off, I'm a season ticket holder with the Islanders that sits with Section 329 Blue and Orange Army. I just wanted to say thank you for last year. That was really, really awesome what you did. Thank you. Thank you. And secondly, secondly, you living in the New York, Long Island area, how tough was it for you to basically just basically stay like inside? Because New York, you have all these trap balls and everything like that between clubs, bars, everything. Even out in Long Island, you have wine country out there as well. Uh, how, how did you manage to stay away from all that? By, uh, by doing what I did. I was open and honest and created my protection network. People have a perception that the team didn't drink around me. Sure they did. They don't think I went to the clubs with them. I went a couple of times. I still have gone to the clubs in Chicago too. You know, it's, uh, it's uh, only when you're comfortable enough to know your strengths and weaknesses you can do things. Long Island was a great place for me and my family. We loved it. Uh, uh, the only thing that sucked there was the traffic. Really rude drivers. <laughs> hey, I live on Long Island. <laughs> really, really, really rude drivers, but the rest was perfect. Rob, we're going to miss you out Long Island. Man. I'm going to miss you too. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robin, for speaking so openly and serving as an inspiration. You talked about, since you are in the NHL, you do have access to the best care. Um, and you are putting yourself out there, and hopefully more people will speak up, um, and you'll inspire others to get help. But then we have the challenge of people who don't have the means to get the care. So now you're making them aware of a problem that they have. How can we encourage fans and people to get the help that they need if they don't necessarily have the resources to do so? That's a, that's a good question. I, I struggle with that question every day of, of my life. That's one of the things right now, sitting down, really trying to focus, see what I'm going to choose for a foundation and stuff like that. But what I'm trying to see here is how can we change again? How can we change the culture to open up the, open up the culture for it to be okay? Because I think it's the, one of the biggest uh, helps for people like us, uh, and it's free. You, you know, it doesn't cost anything to, to have an open society around you. So I'm trying to see is, uh, how can I tackle that, but also on top of it, I said, I tweeted out a couple of, like last month or something, about the medicine prices here in the U.S. is insane. Uh, again, talking about the education, it's not, I love this country, and I'm not bashing on the country, but, you know, when you, you know, when you have a politician uh, like Bernie Sanders saying, you know, attacking the education and uh, the education debt, that's great, but, you know, the way you put it out there, if you really put it out there on how bad what you're actually doing to your youth, you're killing your youth. By capitalizing uh, financially, you're killing your youth and you're actually ro rottening your country from within. You know, when you start putting it in different ways, when people can actually start finding out what they're actually doing and make these changes in big parts of society eventually, that's, that's how you're gonna get there, you know? And I'm not trying to be uh, political or anything like that, but I mean, the more people that speaks up, the more people that, uh, uh, that joins different movements and actually speak, speak up for themselves. I mean, there's, what is it, 330 million people in this country. I mean, there needs to get to a number where, it's, where things can change, and uh, that's how we gotta do it. You gotta talk about it, and, and, and uh, you, gotta, you gotta do something together enough people to make change. I think also it's a larger political issue of like mental health care coverage by insurance companies and things like that. So like, you know, if I do, I mostly take out of pocket because you know, reimbursement for insurance is, is little to none. Um, and then, you know, you have people who are on, on Medicaid and they only cover so much. So I think it's a larger political issue to how to get more people covered for mental health issues. 100% and just last thing, I think the self-education research, I think that actually the millennials are really good at that. 
I think that they actually are looking, don't trust the, the, the politics that much anymore, you know, and starting to look at alternate medications, start looking at, you know, yoga, meditation, breathing exercises and all that stuff. But that's one part of it, you know, like we need to start teaching everyone about the whole spectrums of help out there. And, but it always starts with you. You got to take that step and, and get the help, try to get some, some type of help and try to help yourself in a lot of different ways. But unfortunately, a lot of people are not as fortunate as I am. And that's a big problem and a big moral problem for myself. And I'm struggling in finding where can I put the me most of my time to make the biggest change where I have a lot of people on Twitter or f Facebook and stuff that reach out to me. And I would love to help all of them, but it will take a long, long time for me to help individual cases like that. And it breaks my heart. I have helped a few of them, but I want to help all of them. I can't because I'm trying to see how can I help as many people as I can in my lifetime. That's my goal. And then unfortunately, I got to pick and choose. And it's a, it's a tough moral balance that I struggle with. Robin, you mentioned um, obviously just speaking out helps you with social change and helps you inspire other people. But does publicly sharing your story also help with your sobriety? 100%. That's uh, what I said earlier. I, I think uh, uh, it's a part of a service thing uh, but that it helps other people. It helps me again build those walls because you know what? I don't like. I don't want to be a hypocrite. I really don't want to be. And it's hard to f f balance that line. But if I sit here and talk to you guys and let out a story about how I'm trying to rehabilitate myself and talk to my psychiatrist, do self research, do uh, s s try to stay sober and stuff. If you guys see me on. Twitter or Instagram next month, Robin relapse at a club, you know, it's, it, it would be a pretty big hypocrisy hurdle for me to ever come back from and that would probably spiral me down pretty, so again, I created my own huge, huge wall, again, and it's on purpose, it's on purpose, you got to create these walls, because those are the things, when you're getting dangerously close to stepping over the line, those are the things that hold you back, so 100%. We good? Rob, oh, Sorry, one more. <laughs> Thanks a lot for this. This is excellent. And I'm sitting here listening to you and just, uh-huh, uh-huh, yes, in a full agreement with everything you said. I recently uh, left a television network, a pretty well-known television network. I was an on-air talent person, and for a myriad of reasons, but one, I'm a member of the uh, same here organization, Eric's organization, and one of the... Um, Last things I did before I left, about a month or so prior, was pen a letter to the president of the company and the uh, HR leader uh, about incorporating mental health, wellness programs, strategies, different things, incorporating them. I mean, we could fucking put in $2,000 for a catering for croissants and scones and all this shit three times a month. I mean, these bonuses that are handed out, these salaries, I mean, can we slice a sliver off to maybe incorporate something into, you know, handling some programs once every couple of months? I mean, and not necessarily for me, I'm not gonna sit here and say, I'm alone, you know, I've had my problems, depression, anxiety, yeah. drinking, the whole thing, yeah. but we're all dependent on one another. If you got guys that aren't on top of their game in front of you, mm -hmm. you can't play to your best. If I got a director that isn't on top of his game, I can't go on camera and be my best. So it's a domino effect. Yeah, no, I mean, I see exactly where you're going. And unfortunately, like a lot of us, and I thought the same way as, as, as you're, 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 you're saying here, but I've also realized reality. Reality is that you cannot expect others to change. You, you, like I had a long uh, talk with a lot of different people about this, like how you attack certain issues in the NFL. Are you gonna slap the NFL in the face before you want change? Nothing happens, right? What, what happens uh, with the TBI issues in a lot of the leagues, I know a few, few people in the NHL, right? What, what are they doing? They're accusing the NHL for knowing all these things. And of course they probably have, you know, I don't have the evidence, but of course they probably have. Uh, and uh, you, you slap them in the face with lawsuits and all that stuff. What happens is that nothing happens. It's the same in the political climate in this country today, right? You just, it's about slapping each other in the face as hard as possible and not talk about it. But the only thing I see is that we change, that we change. If you want change in the leagues, it's got to come from the players first. If you want to fix the TBI problem, how about all the thousands of players come together and put one, two, three percent of their salaries in a pot and take care of them? You know, it's going to be a lot easier when you ask the, the owners to come and join. 
when you do it first. If you want change in, in society, what I tried to do this year was show everyone, I have all these issues, I don't need special care, special help, I did majority of the rehabilitation with my self-education with people I have around me, and I went into the, to the league and showed you can do it by fitting in. We need to fit into society as a movement. If we don't fit in society as a movement, look at the snowflake movement. Do everything around me. You know, you have to, do, uh, you have to change around me. They're, they're going to go nowhere. Nowhere. There's no change around them. If you demand, if I demand money from you, you're going to say no. If I create a relationship with you, you know, we, you, you can see a purpose for that money. You might give me the money, you know. You got to think like lawyers. Lawyers, I say this, I'm surrounded by incredibly smart lawyers. One of my best friends is one, one very uh, successful lawyer. We always say a good lawyer tries to make the other side think that it was always their, their plan all along. It's about putting in small seeds to the other side to make, to, make, to make them think that this was our plan, but it was actually just, a, you know, like you got to attack uh, issues that way. You can't come in swinging. I didn't come in swinging for the NHL because, you know what, there's a lot of issues with the NHL, but, you know, I did it. I faked the concussions. I took the drugs. Yes, I, I had easy access to a lot of things with a lot of different things, but I did it. started with me. And now I'm trying to change, and now I'm trying to be open, honest, and show another way because the program, how it's, I love the NHL program, they've become some of my best friends, but I totally disagree how they do things with taking players out, hide them in a box, and put them back in. It doesn't work. It needs to be so, such big change, but it always got to start from us because unfortunately, the big corporation structure is really, really hard to change, so. Yeah, but it's about how you stand up. We heard earlier about rocking the boat. Yeah, it's not good to rock the boat. But you can poke small holes in the boat. You can pull small holes in the boat, and eventually you, you can get to where you want to do. But if you're going to put a big bomb in the boat, it's going to sink. It's, you, you, you get it. it's a different way of attacking things, but we're programmed that it works one way. It's fight or flight. What about conversation and, and compromising and, and taking the first step? You know, even as, as you said, as an employee in your company, even if you don't make as much as the CEO and they get the ridiculous bonuses and stuff, unfortunately, I see that a hard time to change anytime soon because those guys are unfortunately the people that controls most of the decisions. Well, I but if. It's more about survival, though. No, but it is. It is. Well, I'm saying there's different ways to survive. I'm saying there's different ways to survive. I think we, it's unexplored possibilities that's happened. And I think if we, even if we don't make as much of a salary in a normal corporation, even if as the union comes together and put, put on different initiative from the start, it's easier to get help from the actual corporation later. It's always going to start somewhere. And if you ask them to start and change and change nice catering, you know what? Those CEOs like that nice catering. They don't want to be without that. You know, so unfortunately, it's injustice in the world, and if we want change, that's the big population. We have to change. I'm, I, that's that's how I see it.